Hello, everyone. Welcome to this talk. My name is Samad Tiwadi, and today I'm going to present our work, Hide and Seek, Privacy Preserving Rebalancing on Payment Channel Networks. This is joint work with my colleagues Zeta Avarikyoti, Shushtaf P. H. Shak, Yossi Salem, Stefan Schmidt, and Michelle Yeo. Before we move on to the presentation, I would like to thank ResearchDAO and their funding partner, Harmony, I received a travel grant from ResearchDAO, which is what made it possible to attend Financial Crypto in person. So thank you. Now let us move on. Um, in today's talk, I will uh, motivate the problem of rebalancing, which uh, arises from payment channel networks, a solution for the scalability problem. Then I will discuss some prior approaches to rebalancing, uh, discuss some drawbacks and present our work. And finally conclude with a few possible extensions of hide and seek. So the main motivating problem can be seen from this chart over here. Um, the transactions per second throughput of Bitcoin as well as other popular cryptocurrencies is orders of magnitude lower than that of Visa because Visa can process thousands of transactions per second whereas the others as you can see are below hundred in fact. This problem comes from the simple fact that cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin are ultimately distributed ledgers. And these ledgers grow at a fixed rate. So you can record transactions in them, but they can only grow at a constant rate. However, the demand for transactions that wish to be included in the ledger is uh, forever growing. And therefore it is simply not scalable to record each transaction and we need another solution. And that's where payment channels come in. Payment channels are a scalability solution that attempt to batch transactions instead of uploading every single transaction on the ledger, on the blockchain. We first create a payment channel with one on-chain transaction. So Alice and Bob over here can create a channel between each other by depositing X and Y amounts of tokens. And then the payment channel is formed with its starting balance, which is indicated by the green line of zero. Now payments between these two parties is possible and that will cause the balance to fluctuate. And let's say the current balance is the red one. Uh, and uh, this balance can fluctuate and therefore record transactions as long as it, it remains within the bounds. So the balance must not exceed X and it must not be lower than minus Y or the balance that B owes A must not exceed Y. And then you can close the payment channel with one on-chain transaction as well. So with up to two transactions, arbitrarily many transactions are possible between the two parties. And therefore this payment channels are the promising scalability solution, but their real power lies when we actually combine them. So the emergent network, the payment channel network is actually much more powerful than the individual channels. So you don't actually need every user to have a direct payment channel with every other user. For instance, A and C don't have a direct channel between them, but suppose A still wants to pay C. This payment is possible uh, on the payment channel network via B. So A pays the same amount of tokens to B and B pays C. And in this way, the payment is possible. Uh, B may charge a small amount of uh, routing fee for this purpose. And as a result, Various possible payments are allowed, but actually the fact that payments can be routed through intermediaries also means that uh, many uh, wealthy individuals are incentivized to join the channel and therefore they earn some transaction fees through routing. However, multiple uh, uses of the same channel can result in uh, depleted channels. So let's say that uh, we're back to this example of uh, one channel between A and B. And uh, suppose it, the balance is uh, really close to X. This means that further payment in the direction from A to B is not possible. It would likely make the balance exceed our amount X and therefore it's not possible. And so if A wants to continue paying B, it would uh, necessitate a topping up transaction, which is an on-chain transaction, which increases the capacity of this payment channel. Now we would like to avoid on-chain updates as much as possible. And uh, these users, uh, perhaps they have various channels with other people. So for example, maybe A and B have channels with C and they may want to rebalance by transferring the funds from one channel to another. 
And uh, this is what we term as rebalancing. So rebalancing changes the balances of individual channels, but it only means that the money is uh, being pa passed on from one channel to another, meaning we don't actually want a certain user, for example, A, to get a net positive or the net deficit by participating in rebalancing. It is simply a movement of funds from one channel to another without utilizing the blockchain. So how do we model rebalancing? Uh, given this triangular graph, um, we suppose these are the balances uh, given by the red lines. And you can see that they are all depleted uh, to some extent. And we can also see that one way to improve the state of all of the channels would be if A pays C, C pays B, and B pays A some amount of tokens. And that kind of a payment would make all of the balances closer to the center and therefore more, uh, more uh, desirable. So, and notice that this specific uh, amount by which the channels need to be rebalanced and which direction they need to be rebalanced is something that the users themselves can determine because they have access to the balance of, the, uh, of their channels. So suppose the user specify this amount and what we can do is we can replace each channel with a directed graph, uh, with, a, with a directed edge and a capacity on the edge. So for over here, it indicates that B would like a rebalancing of some amount of uh, tokens from B to A, and this amount must not be more than four. So up to four units of rebalancing is desired along this channel. You can also see that uh, the right rebalancing in this case would be a flow of four units along A, C, B, and back to A. And that would mean neither party actually gains money or loses money. Um, which is again, the critical property of rebalancing. So in fact, once we have modeled the problem as a directed graph with the uh, capacities on edges, um, the problem of rebalancing is simply finding the appropriate circulation on this graph. A circulation is a special kind of network flow. Uh, so of course this flow should respect the capacities of the edges, but moreover, the flow would be uh, considered a circulation if the net flow through each vertex. So the amount of outgoing flow minus the amount of incoming flow is zero. Uh, so those are called circulations and uh, rebalancing are precisely circulations on uh, the graph that we have uh, constructed. So now that we have uh, modeled rebalancing in a certain way, let us understand one of the first approaches to rebalancing, which uh, is the default implementation on the lightning client which we will call the local search for lack of a better term. So let's uh, have this consider this graph. This will be our working example for the rest of the talk. And we see that there's an edge from A to B of uh, capacity 10, which means A would like to rebalance in this direction of at most 10 units. So suppose uh, A or Alice starts a local search uh, to rebalance this specific channel and uh, A creates the request and passes it on to B. Uh, B looks at B's neighbors and uh, propagates the request to C. And then let's say that C will find it to D and D will pass it on to A. And when D returns to A, you, you see that a cycle has been determined, a cycle where each user would like to uh, route some amount of flow through the channel and execute a rebalancing. <laughs> and then they find that six units are possible along the cycle. So this is the following uh, rebalancing that occurs. Now this, uh, this is a good solution. It's actually lightweight and it can occur asynchronously across a network because uh, various users can start and conclude their local searches whenever they want. However, one of the drawbacks is that the resultant rebalancing is uh, not necessarily optimal. For example, over here we have one cycle of six units of flow. But if you observe the previous graph, another cycle of four units from A to B, B to C, and C back to A is possible. And uh, therefore, just routing one cycle is not optimal. Next, this kind of, uh, uh, this approach to rebalancing may fail due to fluctuating balances. What do I mean by that? This local peer-to-peer -peer search is time consuming. And uh, while it occurs, individual users, for instance, uh, when, the, uh, when the request come, uh, comes to C, C will pass it on to D based on the capacities of the edges between C and D, not necessarily based on the balance of this current channel. 
And uh, what this means is once a cycle has been found, it means a certain amount of time has elapsed. And then you need to double check if a certain amount of flow across the cycle can actually be routed. And this amount may not match what you initially computed because the balances of all of the channels are constantly fluctuating. Notice this could be avoided by having users freeze their funds while the search is occurring. But uh, then it would mean uh, all kinds of attacks, such as griefing attack, is possible. Next, let us talk about the second approach, which is Revive, which was introduced by Khalil and Gervais in 2017. Revive is an opt-in protocol, unlike the local search, which is asynchronous. Uh, this one requires uh, users from the payment channel network to come together as participants and find the optimal rebalancing amongst themselves. And they were the first to model rebalancing as an LP, as a linear program. And uh, for the optimization enthusiasts in the audience, I have written the linear program right here. And uh, what they did was this uh, linear program is uh, solved by one specific participant of the protocol, which would be one delegate uh, who computes the best rebalancing. Um, and in their, um, in their protocol, the best rebalancing is, uh, it is a, uh, quantified by the total amount of flow that occurs through all the edges. So it is the sum of all the flows across edges is their notion of optimality. And then uh, this flow must be executed atomically across the network. And this leads to a few, re a few uh, drawbacks. So although the rebalancing that is computed is optimal, unlike the local search, it's, uh, it actually leaks a lot of information. So the vibe is not private. Since one delegate has to compute the linear program, it means that all the other participants must uh, forward sensitive financial information to this delegate. So they must forward the capacities on edges, which is after all the proxy for the balance and uh, the traffic that goes through this channel. So you would want to hide this, but in uh, Revive, you have to uh, propagate this information to the delegate. And then the delegate computes the best rebalancing and then every participant must validate this solution. So the delegate gives the rebalancing solution to all the participants and the rebalancing is only possible if every participant signs it and validates. As a consequence, all the participants also learn the rebalancing that will occur across the network, which is another privacy setback. And the other consequence of this validating requirement is robustness. Any single participant can deny rebalancing across the entire network, which makes it difficult to uh, execute these uh, flows atomically of the entire rebalancing. Finally, the protocol was designed for Ethereum, so it has a smart contract implementation, and that makes it not directly compatible with Bitcoin. We would like to uh, address some of these drawbacks, and uh, for that purpose, we present hide and seek which is another opt-in protocol for rebalancing, which enjoys the following properties. First of all is uh, balance conservation, which is a, let's say our correctness requirement. So no user must gain or lose money by participating in their protocol. Secondly, there's privacy. So we don't want to leak the balances of channels. And we also don't want to indirectly leak this by uh, leaking the capacities on edges when we, uh, when we model the rebalancing problem. However, we cannot guarantee full privacy since actually executing the rebalancing requires signing certain HTLCs. And for that, users do need to know some information. Therefore, we model our, uh, we, we formulate our privacy definition as users must learn exactly what they need to know in order to sign the HTLCs and no more. And that's what we achieve as well. Our protocol is also optimal in that it computes the rebalancing with the total flow maximized, uh, similarly to Revive. Although I would like to comment that this notion of optimality can easily be altered. You can change the objective function and as long as it is linear, uh, you can still do it without any slowdowns in the complexity, in the computation, uh, sorry. Finally, it has a simple Bitcoin implementation. So. Instead of uh, tackling the problem of routing the entire rebalancing, uh, executing the entire rebalancing atomically, we actually break down the rebalancing into cycles and each cycle is uh, executed independently, which means that uh, it can 
be executed as a simple self payment which is a uh, actually the same as a multi hop payment so it it only requires simple bitcoin implementation so how do we actually compute the rebalancing this slide is actually the same as the modeling rebalancing one um except instead of having the simplifying assumption that users can determine and uh, specify by how much they wish to rebalance we ask them to secret share this information to a subset of the participants which are the delegates so out of all the participants in the network we select a few let's say by a cryptographic sortition and those are the delegates who are tasked with computing the optimal rebalancing via a multi party computation Now suppose that the delegates have computed the optimal rebalancing which is f via multi party computation um we don't ask f to be executed atomically but rather first we decompose this f into a bunch of cycles uh let's say f1 up to fk which are cyclical rebalancings but that if you were to execute all of these it would be equivalent to executing f and then we ask the cycles to be executed atomically Moreover, the cycle decomposition we have, we require the cycles to be uh, so-called sign consistent cycles, and uh, what I mean by that is uh, can be can be seen in this graph. Here we have a certain rebalancing which can be written as two cycle flows. Let's say the green cycle and the red one, and notice that whenever these two cycles are uh, adjacent, meaning when they both go through the same edge, for instance, the edge from A to B. they are going uh, in the same direction so they are consistent in their signs compare this with the following rebalancing uh, so first i would like to comment this is the exact same rebalancing as the previous one it's just that the cycle decomposition is different and we decompose it into these two cycles but this is a sign inconsistent cycle decomposition why consider for example the edge from c to d the green edge uh, requires flow from c to d whereas the red cycle requires flow from d to c so they are going in opposite directions and they are sign inconsistent sign inconsistency is a problem when it comes to rebalancing because it means the cycles are not matching the incentives of the individuals participating in our protocol to see this uh, consider the consider these two cycles from the perspective of user c we know that c wants to rebalance from c to d so this channel requires rebalancing to occur in the direction from c to d and that means that c is very much happy with routing the green cycle because it is matching with its incentives but not with the red one because the red one if we see to a sign off on the red cycle it would involve reducing the total amount of flow going from c to d so perhaps uh, if we were to take our optimal rebalancing and decompose it into the following cycle decomposition perhaps c would only sign off on the green cycle and not on the red one because that's the only one that matches with its incentives but we avoid such situations by ensuring that the cycles are all sign consistent meaning if you would want to sign off on one cycle you would actually want to sign off on all of them the other benefit of taking a cycle decomposition is that certain users who want to slow down the protocol or who want to just uh, affect everyone else's rebalancing they have less power so if we were to re uh, if we were to execute the entire rebalancing atomically uh, a single user let's say d could veto the whole process and prevent any rebalancing to occur but if we have a cycle decomposition then d can only prevent the execution of cycles that go through d so d can prevent the green cycle from executing but not the red one and that increases our robustness against certain uh, uh, let's not say malicious but uh, trolling parties um so this is our protocol first we have a uh, secret sharing of your, uh, our private data and then there's a multi party computation that ensues the optimal rebalancing which is computed is then broken down into sign consistent uh, cycle rebalancing and i should uh, also add that this decomposition can be computed uh, efficiently by a simple depth first search approach and then individual cycles must be executed as a self payment uh, using the same hdlc construction that multi hop payments use and that is a nutshell summary of our protocol
let me now comment on the multi-party computation aspect because that is the one which slows down hide and seek the most. However, I want to add that for the following reasons, even implementing our uh, rebalancing problem in MPC does not slow it down by much. For instance, uh, you should notice that the number of delegates that compute the MPC are lower than the number of participants. So you could have a thousand participants in hide and seek, but you could only, uh, maybe you only use five delegates who do the MPC. And uh, of course the security definition is that as long as one of the delegates is honest, uh, you have uh, privacy and correctness. Next, we don't actually solve the rebalancing problem as a linear program, but we formulate it as a min cost flow problem. Uh, this simple uh, reformulation affords us a significant speed up because min cost flow problems can be solved in uh, nearly linear time as recent research has indicated. But the linear programs in general cannot be solved in linear time or actually even uh, it is an open problem to decide if there exists a strongly polynomial algorithm to solve linear programming in general. Moreover, our min cost flow problem uh, formulation of rebalancing, it satisfies the Hoffman Gale conditions. And these conditions tell you when a certain uh, optimization problem, uh, a linear program or a min cost flow problem has integer solutions. And so because it satisfies these conditions, we know that there will always be one optimum solution with integral coordinates, assuming of course that the capacities of all edges are integer. And this means that we can utilize integer arithmetic instead of floating point arithmetic in our multi-party computation. That concludes the description of hide and seek, but I would like to add a few possible extensions to this work. The first one being that of incentive compatibility. And here the observation is that the same unit of flow would be valued differently across different channels. Uh, one simple uh, example of it is that if one channel is of total capacity uh, 100 units and the other one of 10, uh, simply speaking, one unit of flow on the 10 unit channel would have a greater relative impact on how depleted it is and therefore it could be valued more. The idea is instead of maximizing the total flow, we would want to maximize a weighted total flow. So the flow across an edge is actually multiplied by a certain valuation, which the users determine. But this extension is really a challenge of mechanism design because we want to incentivize users to report their private valuations honestly. And we hope to do so by computing a price function, a price vector cleverly and charging users based on their valuations. Um, so that would be one extension. And the other one is transaction aggregation, which is a slight paradigm shift instead of considering rebalancing at all, we have the following problem, that we are given a bunch of transactions um, from one vertex to another in our network. And we want to find a subset of these transactions and then aggregate them, meaning we find one flow across the network, which somehow simultaneously executes all the included transactions. And then we wish to execute the aggregate rather than executing the transactions one by one. The idea is that performing transaction aggregation can increase the throughput of the network and reduce fees for individual users, and also perhaps give us greater privacy by hiding more information from the intermediaries in the multi-hub payments. However, this problem is indeed NP-hard in general, so we can only hope for uh, efficient approximations or possibly efficient algorithms for certain special cases. But that concludes my talk. And once again, I would like to thank uh, Research Dao and uh, Harmony for their travel grant. And I would like to thank you for your attention.